Okay, we overcame our first objective and everyone found their seats, so that's a positive. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, this is a great panel today, which includes everyone, and that's what we're looking to do, include everyone in lunar exploration. And we've got a really uh, diverse, wide-ranging uh, list of panelists. I was joking, the only uh, panel that was bigger than this one was the event last night uh, at, the, at the very start, so that had 3,000 people. We've got uh, 27, so no we're, we're getting monitor. close. Um, it is great to see that the international community is focusing its attention on the challenges and the excitement of establishing uh, permanent human presence beyond low Earth orbit. Um, it has now been 50 years, it's coming up on 50 years since the first Apollo mission. Uh, and the idea of humans inhabiting the moon, moon is really becoming a reality. But it is very sad to say and very long overdue that we are just getting to this now. However, 2019 looks to be an incredibly exciting year for lunar exploration on many fronts. Uh, the Orion spacecraft is looking to do a journey to, to the moon. Uh, a number of other companies, NASA plans for the deep space getaway, a wide array of our private institutions and private initiatives. Uh, and uh, just a few of these examples uh, are here on the stage today. I think you can't walk through the hall, uh, the exhibit hall, and not bump into a lunar rover, which is good to see, a, a cautionary tale though, watch out for them, but they are everywhere. Uh, and then the, just the international focus on the lunar mission, uh, lunar missions, and it's what it's doing, and it's the fueling of the innovation and the necessity for reusable launch vehicles, reusable launch landers, uh, in situ resource utilization of facilities, uh, and even the concept, the possible concept of the, the moon village and the open architecture where many uh, opportunities can, can contribute. So today's global space industry sector, we have traditional companies, and new space companies, and they hold the key to the technology and the talent and the resources and the capabilities that are needed to usher in this next phase of human space exploration. So collaboration between the international enterprises, that's what we're gonna discuss today, both large and small, and how we're gonna achieve these goals together. And we also wanna talk about the talent pool and how we are engaging uh, the young um, and excited generation that we have that will, will be able to experience this. So as I said, I have an all-star list of panelists today. Um, I will spare you the long biographies of each of them, but just know that all of them have a job, which they get paid for, and they're all educated at some sort of university level. So they all have degrees, uh, which I was assured of. That was a, a check the box for them. So I, I scattershot them on the stage, so just, uh, and I know the, the 12 font on their name tags won't show up, so. Uh, when I call your name, just raise your hand, just to identify Tony Antonelli, who's the Advanced Programs Director uh, for Commercial and Civil Space at Lockheed Martin, small organization, Tony, right there. Uh, Jurgen Ackerman, the uh, group General Secretary, the Ariane Group. Peter McGrath, uh, the Director of Global Sales and Marketing for Space Exploration at the Boeing Company. Maria Antonetti per Perino, the Director of Relations with Space Associations at, at Talis Alenia, but also a two-time IAF Vice President, so very near and dear to this organization. Dr. Oliver Eukenhoffel, I'm not sure, I, I always butcher that a little bit, Oliver, and I, I apologize for that, but he's the Head of Site here at Bremen and Vice President on On-Orbit Servicing and Exploration. Nicholas Farber, who's the COO of Blue Horizon, Kyle Asirno, uh, Managing Director of Europe for iSpace. Carson Becker, Carson is here with us today. He's the Deputy CTO and Head of Electronics at PTS Scientist, and he just got the nod to come in to fill in about two, or two hours ago. So uh, thank you, Carson, and, and good luck. And good luck. <laughs> uh, and finally, Asan Chowdhury, uh, Dr. Asan Chowdhury, who's the Director of NASA's Miro Center for Space Exploration and Technology Re uh, Research at the University of Tech. Texas, El Paso. So with that, you're done hearing from me for about 28 minutes. Um, and we're gonna have each of the speakers kind of come up and give a little introduction of what they're doing, what they're working on, what excites them about lunar exploration. And then we're gonna kind of do a lightning round of questions uh, for each of the panelists. Uh, so I have some questions teed up, but I, I always encourage questions from the audience. Uh, and I think that will make for a lively session. So, without further ado, Tony, why don't we get you started? You're, you're first out of the gun. Excellent. 
Thanks. Are we good sitting now? Yeah, just sitting. You can sit down, you can good. walk around Oprah <sighs> style, whatever you'd like to do. <laughs> you can dance. Um, so, uh, so like Eric said, I'm at, uh, at Lockheed Martin. I'll, I'll try to keep this short with the size of the, pan uh, the panelists. Um, the, it's, it's not going to work without including everyone, right? So this was a, when I saw the title of this one, I was like, how would anybody consider themselves excluded from, uh, from lunar exploration? Um, Eric said it's been uh, 50 years since, uh, since we did the Apollo 11 mission. Unfortunately, it's closing in on 50 years uh, from the last time anybody's uh, been to the surface of the moon. I'll talk uh, both in parallel and probably uh, back and forth about uh, uh, small-scale robotic uh, rovers and uh, what I call uh, large-scale uh, human landers. Um, they, uh, we got a presentation from the heads of agencies on, uh, on the Chinese progress so far. They've got their uh, telecommunications relay already in place. They've got uh, rover plans on the way and, and they offered up uh, use of their telecommunications relay that anybody that wanted to have a conversation with them. So I was pretty encouraged by that because there's a, it's hard to get there and there's a few things you're going to need and if you don't have to do it all yourself, uh, it's going to make it uh, a lot easier and go a lot faster. Um, for me, at, uh, it starts with getting there at the human scale and uh, NASA and Lockheed Martin are pretty far along with uh, Exploration Mission 1, Orion spacecraft. Uh, we're down to just installing a, a couple of avionics boxes, installing a hatch, and then we're going to get the European service module delivered to Florida here uh, real soon. We'll do some uh, integration and tests that's, uh, that's pretty extensive and thorough to make sure that uh, EM-2 is ready to carry crew uh, out past the moon for the first time in a while. Uh, the next piece uh, is the gateway. I think uh, folks have been talking about that. It is... Uh, to me, from a human exploration of the moon, definitely makes uh, the moon accessible to everyone. All of today's rockets can, uh, can get to the gateway uh, from a logistics standpoint, uh, combined with Orion to get crew there, then you're well on your way to design. And uh, what's uh, portrayed on the chart here, which is a reusable uh, lander designed uh, to get down from the gateway uh, down to the surface of the moon, originally kind of daytime, uh, two week stays on the lunar surface, uh, and then back up to the gateway. Uh, some of what we're doing is, uh, I'll only, only say Mars a few times, on the pathway to Mars. I'd like most of the design trades uh, to be extensible to Mars as opposed to optimized for the lunar surface. And then uh, we don't have it in the chart here and it's an active competition but NASA's looking for uh, today payload uh, landers on the surface of the moon and, and uh, we're, we intend, have every intention of competing for that right now. So. Great, thanks so much Tony. Uh, Jurgen, you're next out of the, the gate. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we are the guys who can bring you there as you just said before. So in Europe we are currently developing the next generation of launcher which is called Ariane 6. So it's a very, uh, and normally there should be a small film, not this one. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, We're pushing the partnership uh, early. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We're announcing it. Why not? Club. <laughs> and this, uh, this new launcher is really is designed for production exploitation to be reactive and uh, on the market. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a major revolution because we have changed everything. Uh, we have really changed the technologies. I'll come back to that. But also the industrial organization and the governance of the system to make it more lean, more simple, more quick, more efficient. Okay, uh, you will see the, the simulation. Do we have the slide so, for Ar um, Ariane? The, 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 this Ariane 6 will exist in, in two versions, so the Ariane 62 and the Ariane 64 being a two a booster version and a four mm -hmm. booster version more or less uh, performant, mm -hmm. gives a lot of flexibility and in for any kind of, of needs. Okay, the, the, the performance, the power of our a rocket comes from um, the cryogenic propulsion system. So we have some solid boosters, but the main stage and the upper stage are cryogenic, which uh, gives it uh, a very high flexibility, but also performance. We'll speak about that later more in detail. But we also involved a number of uh, innovations, <coughs> many innovations related to production manufacturing technologies to be <coughs> more 
uh, more green, more efficient, uh, and reduce the lead times. And by the way, keep the same reliability. It's clear, rocketry is all about reliability, and here we will not uh, reduce our two-day track record, for sure not. But uh, another very interesting feature you see, so we really foresee uh, lunar <laughs> exploration missions with our launcher. Um, uh, one of the major, uh, interesting features is uh, that okay, 3D printing, everybody uses, we as well, but it allows us to have a very special feature called the APU, the Auxiliary Power Unit, which is uh, there to pressurize the upper stage over very long missions and with the, with the uh, hydrogen oxygen propellants. And this only 3D printable uh, feature allows us to really uh, imagine very uh, powerful missions to the moon and any other kind of orbits. So, um, we, um, industrially speaking, we organized our industrial chain in a more concentrated way, building, uh, let's say, champions working with us. Uh, and uh, these industrial partners allow us to, uh, to come up by 2020 with the, with the first launch. Uh, this year was a very successful year because we have been testing all the main engines. So the main stage engine, the Vulcan 2.1 since January, the Vinci, the upper stage engine, this reignitable cryogenic engine now is more or less at the end of its qualification tests. So we finished all the tests and we will have one more and that's, that's it. So it's really up and running. And we also had our first solid booster test in July, which is a, a very large monolithic booster of 140 tons of uh, propellant, so it's also quite a, uh, a very good achievement, I would say. So the maturity of uh, the product is, is growing quickly. We are currently building our integration factories in France, in Germany, in Kourou as well, the launch pad. And, uh, and so the piece parts are now visible here in Bremen. In the Bremen side, we already have the first tanks of the upper stage. And uh, so in two years from now, we're going to be there with this uh, very interesting launch room. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Jürgen. Next, we have Peter McGrath from the, the Boeing company. Peter, tell us what's new. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm gonna show a slide here in a second that's, that shows a lunar lander concept, but I wanna step back for a minute and uh, talk in general about the moon. You know, as we look, I think for, and I won't say the first time, but I think we've got a really good time where we've got coalesced missions around going back to the moon. I mean, if you look at all the international partners that have been cooperating on station, I think we've all agreed we want to go forward to the moon and then on to Mars, and that's kind of a, a good coalescing point today. And as such, when we start looking at going to the moon, we want to do it in a more sustainable way than we did in the Apollo program. You know, I, and, I, and I, I kind of look at history a lot too, and if I look back at the days of Apollo, there was actually some consideration about putting a permanent presence in a lunar orbit. They were talking about a service module or something they leave up there as a way to make it more of a extensible and a, a sustainable architecture. Well, today we're talking about something similar. It's the gateway. And, and we talk about including everyone as our theme. You know, the gateway in our path to the moon and Mars is really a global endeavor. It's going to take multiple nations to make it happen. And when you look at the gateway, it's not a U.S. element. It's not a European element. It's really an international element. And it's gonna take pieces from each one of us to actually make that happen. And it's a great opportunity to actually leverage a permanent presence to be able to do things like telerobotic operations on the surface of the moon. It's gonna allow us to do sample return missions up to the gateway that we could then bring back in Orion to do interrogation of. It's gonna allow us to go, and that's what I'm showing here, you know, to look at reusable landers. You know, our concept of a lander is something that you know, tries to make the crew module reusable. And, you know, the whole idea about reusability, looking at economics is you want something that costs too much to actually re replace every time to make it more reusable. So we see that as the human aspect of this lander, something on top. You're still gonna throw away ascent vehicles because you can't take it all back. It just isn't efficient from a mass fraction perspective, but we look at bringing back the human side of it. So, you know, just uh, the thought is that this is not one company, this is not one nation, this is something global we're gonna all do together. And I think there's an opportunity for all of us to participate. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Maria? Yeah. Ball's in your court. Ready? Yeah. Very happy to be here this morning and to share with you what uh, we tried to, to <coughs> do in uh, Thales Alenia space in support to exploration. I pick up from Eric, uh, uh, that 
just said that, in fact, lunar exploration now is indeed an international uh, environment, an international option for collaboration. Uh, I've been participated, I've been part of, I would say for the last 20 years, uh, of many discussion around uh, the exploration roadmap. And only a few years ago, uh, the typical sentence was, Mars is for US, uh, lunar is for the internationals. And I always felt very proud to be part of the internationals. Now, it is indeed an international bet that we need to win altogether. And so, in a few minutes, let me wrap up uh, uh, what we try to contribute to. So, obviously, uh, Lob G is in our heart. Uh, at international level, we try to sustain you guys, uh, thanks to the Next Step 2 uh, program. Uh, at ESA level, we just got two contracts uh, for two studies, one about the ESPRI module and the other one about the international habitat. Uh, the ESPRI will be mainly carried on by our French colleagues, why home is home in Torino. So the, the, the habitation modules are our language, eh? our best way to express uh, our competencies. So uh, we, we are designing uh, advanced modules because the, the, the LOBG will also help us understanding which are the main uh, uh, delta plus eh? we need to realize uh, to make this uh, habitat uh, good for a transit vehicle to Mars, good for lunar and Martian surface. So we do that uh, uh, using also new tools. We are before uh, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, uh, immersive environment. So these are what we daily uh, speak about uh, uh, in Torino. So moving uh, to war, if I can move, otherwise I ask the guys to help me just do a click, that can work. But anyway, we are also involved slide. in the ASEN vehicle uh, because, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I should mention the fact that exploration is so important for us that we are uh, the prime contractor of ExoMars. So we are going to, to launch uh, the ExoMars uh, uh, 2020 in, in uh, less than two years from now. And then the, the next, we are getting ready uh, for the next mission uh, to come after ExoMars, that will be uh, the mass return vehicle. At the same way, we also want to go back uh, to the moon, go forward, uh, as uh, it was rightly said yesterday by uh, Jim. Uh, so go forward to the moon, but also bring back people, so us and vehicle for sure. Uh, and then on the surface, we are working on enabling technology developments, also in this case in a modern way, because we, we put together uh, teams involving not just the large system integrator that is our company, but uh, small and medium companies, especially uh, local ones. Uh, we have a local region uh, in Torino that is very... Um, that is really paying attention eh, to, to uh, facilitate the integration between the large company, the small one, and obviously the universities. And so, as far as uh, enabling technology are concerned, anything involving uh, the utilization of local resources, so in situ resource utilization for mainly for oxygen uh, and, and water uh, also, uh, but also uh, inflatable structure, uh, but also 3D printing, uh, so building the new habitats also and covering them using uh, the regolith that is available there. Uh, you see a mock-up of a pressurized uh, rover uh, that we realize uh, in hardware, not just uh, virtual, uh, and uh, that allow us to test, uh, for example, metallic wheels, uh, uh, for example, uh, automatic navigation, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're Thanks welcome. so much, Maria. Now we have uh, our hometown friend here, Oliver, who, uh, and thank you for all the hospitality here in Bremen. It's been fantastic. 
and give the, uh, the Airbus perspective. You're welcome. <laughs> so yesterday you heard uh, as the opening speech of the heads of agencies on this, on this panel here, you heard the visions. And I, for, for me, there was one remarkable statement when talking about the moon. It was Jim Bridenstine saying, we're going to the moon and this time we're going to stay. We're going to do it sustainably, right? And it almost looks like I scribbled this after I heard that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I'm going to pick on that um, because uh, doing that sustainably to stay means we believe we should do it right from the beginning. So I, I think it is not on designing a lander or designing a gateway or designing the next spacecraft. It is on trying to find a solution where we can benefit from previous developments as much as possible to make quicker progress, to go there quick, right? And then, uh, we're seeing also the label of this panel here involve everyone, right? Uh, create an infrastructure that allows everybody to participate. So I think many of us here on the panel, we're um, part of this exclusive club of people who have learned how to do space, even in deep space, for decades now. So we know exactly what we're expecting there. But involving everybody means that, that we need to set up an infrastructure that allows people to go up there and do what they want to do. So let's not be dictating what they're supposed to do, but let's create an environment that allows to develop things, that allows things to develop as well, right? And then we will see that this is going to be an expansion process where humanity has started to move into space, and the next step probably is going to be the moon. So let's think about connecting the moon to the Earth. And for, for Airbus, of course, we're a transportation company, so um, we think that we need to find solutions that allows all the launchers that are currently in development, be it the Ariane launcher or uh, the SLS or, let's say, some other launches which will fill the spectrum, to, to get as far as possible. And that's then try to, to fill the gaps that we're seeing there with the uh, capability to reach the lunar surface. For cargo, but then also eventually for, for crew, for, for people. But uh, we also think that besides the fact that we love transportation, um, access to space need to be redefined if you talk about a sustainable expansion process. So access to space also means you need to access data. You want to access robotically what you're doing on the, on the surface. So, um, access to space also means, let's talk about how you can have a consistent and continuous con uh, communication chain to all areas on the lunar surface. If you establish that, then you will find that you have a seamless connection of the moon, and not just physically for bringing hardware or bringing human beings up there. So that, that means that basically everything that you see today circling around the Earth quite likely in the further distant future, you will see that circling the moon. Right? We need to have telecommunication to provide us infrastructure on the moon surface. And equally important, I wouldn't call it navigation, I would call it timing, right? Moon is quite a distance away, not so far as the Mars, but if you really want to build up an ecosystem involving the moon, you should better have a constant timing signal between the lunar surface and the Earth's surface, right? So that, that's the, the concept of Galileo, that's the concept of GPS. So let's think about that, connect it to get rid of the latency effects. And I think all what is planned right now, what I heard yesterday and what you see also here in the, in the graphics, I think that helps, right? Because the gateway really could be a gateway for communication, for other purposes, for going robotically down to the surface of the moon, for staying there. Orion, where we are partnering with Lockheed and, and with ESA and NASA, obviously is a great shuttle to reach the gateway. But then you need to have additional elements, and we should all jointly work together to make progress as quick as possible, because we believe that once we connect the moon to the Earth system, then you will see that there is room for everybody to make business. And, and uh, that means uh, competition, that, that's a great point, but uh, we will see that we will not have to be scared that somebody's kicked out of the race because there will be room and business for everybody if we go in this direction. Station still is um, a great opportunity to learn. So we believe that uh, while going to the moon is not exploring the moon and then dropping what, what we've done, that's the, the character, that's the nature of an expansion process. You still stay where you are, right? But you're just going further. 
uh, which basically means that we believe that, that in low Earth orbit you will have a support infrastructure that allows us to test things while we're going to the moon. And we are starting to do that already by, by trying to allow as many commercial customers as possible reach the station, for instance, with our little Bartolomeo investment there, where it's not so fascinating to see what you could do with an external platform to the station. It's more fascinating to see how can you connect the new customers who do not necessarily need to know how to do space into a space environment, because this is really the basic for a new business case that allows newcomers to the business to focus on their stuff well, we can help them doing the tough stuff that we've learned for decades now together with the agencies. So that's going to be a learning environment, and while learning, why not try and commercialize that? So I think that's going to be an ecosystem where you can no longer differentiate that's moon and that's earth. It's just going to be connected in one ecosystem. Thanks so much, Oliver. Nicholas, you got a lot of in interesting and exciting things going on uh, at Blue Horizon. I want to share some of the sure. excitement you guys have. Sure, okay, so maybe the one or two points I wanted to pass through from our side or from Blue Horizon's side. So really, first of all, maybe not everybody knows Blue Horizon. Blue Horizon is a new venture fully um, owned and backed by venture capital by OHB. So we are based in Luxembourg and only around really since a few months, possibly half a year. And our entire focus is on life sciences, space life sciences in particular, but also eyeing on one or the other applications on Earth. This being said, of course, we are on the, op on the opposite spectrum as now Boeing, Lockheed, and so on. So we are really a young company, uh, yeah, just existing for a few months. So that's one, um, the one focus we are having. It's really to try and bring value whenever life needs to be brought in extreme environments, the moon being one kind of extreme environment. So here too, we are very much interested in habitat technology, closed loop systems and stuff like that. Similarly, we're also having uh, applications on Earth, where we're also trying to bring back to Earth some research that has been done internally within OHB uh, at some point during the past uh, decades and to just see um, what can also be brought back to Earth. For instance, we have one nice example in Luxembourg, since we are Luxembourg based, there's one nice example of soil contamination there, where some one or the other microorganisms that is actually maybe usable at some point when talking about uh, terraforming Mars or the Moon, at the same time you might be able to bring back one or the other technology to Earth. The other point I wanted to bring through today, and that's maybe one of the mandates we are having uh, as Blue Horizon, as part of the OHB group, is actually since it was also part of the agenda today, so the sole idea of education of next generation workforce. I mean, we heard to the left and to the right this very idea that if you really want to make the moon village happen or whatever really big effort on the moon, you need to have a new generation of engineers and people where we internally at OHP just think that they have to think a little bit differently. I mean, it's a vast endeavor and a lot of different things need to tie together to make it happen. So what we uh, launched at OHP and Blue Horizon is actually having demanded to bring this program through at OHP is the so-called Advanced Students Team Research in Space program, the acronym being ASTRI. And it's really this idea of uh, having a group-wide effort focusing on the moon and focusing on the next generation of lunar missions, new space lunar missions, but also the more institutional ones, and trying to actually to understand the whole ecosystem of what's going on with young engineers and really new ideas. So it's very exciting so far to work with these young people who will become the next generation lunar focused engineers at OHP. And just hearing their ideas, just talking about new crazy applications of what you may be able to do on the moon, and also studying the ecosystem of current landers, current capabilities, and also maybe trying to come up with an overall maybe lunar um, supply chain analysis of what really needs to be done. So that's maybe the one point I wanted to bring in. It's this idea of um, education, next generation engineers that might just have to be slightly different the next generation than what we are having from engineers today. 
I'd like to focus a little bit on that uh, later in the question and on how you guys are doing it and attracting that, that young talent. I think that's a challenge for everyone in the industry. Uh, speaking of young talent, we, we got Kyle here uh, from iSpace, uh, who are do, doing fantastic things all across the globe. So Kyle, why don't you give a little overview of what you guys have been up to? Thanks, Eric. And uh, if my colleagues maybe don't mind, sometimes you have to differentiate yourself when you're sitting beside two giants. So I'll stand up and just get out of the box a little bit. And we bit. gave you a bigger chair, too. So yeah. It's <laughs> on purpose. My name is Kyle Ascherno. I'm the managing director of iSpace Europe. And you know, just a few years ago, five years ago, iSpace was a small company with three men in Tokyo sitting on a tatami mat trying to figure out how to get to the moon. Today, we are a company of 80 people in three different countries with over 15 different nationalities working for us. So when we talk about involving everyone, our company is really trying to do that. We started as a team at the Google Lunar X Prize, and our focus was on developing micro rovers. Always, we've been trying to start really small, and so we didn't even look at landers. We were just focusing on a rover, and our mission was to get a ride with someone else. Those of you who are familiar with the Google Lunar X Prize, you know that in March of this year, the Google Lunar X Prize was canceled. After 10 years of hard work, nobody was actually able to get a lander to the moon in time. And after trying so hard to get a ride to the moon, we realized that, well, maybe we have to do it ourselves. So we went to the market, to Japan, bankers and venture capitalists and corporates, and we told them our vision and our story, and they were willing to, to go with us on this mission. In December, we raised 95 million US dollars. And with that, we're going to develop our own lunar lander that you can see right here. Now, what you may have seen last week was that we have announced our first two missions. We're going to be flying with SpaceX. Mission one is going to happen in 2020. And for this mission, we're going to just try to do an orbit around the lunar surface. This is an early success for us to show that we can actually get into low lunar orbit. And then we're going to attempt a, a hard landing. And our second mission in 2021, I hope will be the first time that a private company has ever landed on another planetary body. For us, this will be, of course, a huge milestone. And our intention then is to continue to develop this, this lander. And this lander is a micro lander. A lot of my colleagues, what you've what you, what you seen earlier was that they're developing two types of systems, human landers or the gateway, which is going to be in orbit. But what we're really focusing on is delivering small packages to the moon, 30 kilograms. And what's really good about 30 kilograms is that we can do this very often. So we want to be fast, and we want to be early, and we want to prove to the market that we can do this for the first time. So I hope that you'll continue to, to stay with us on this journey, and uh, wish us luck in 2020. Great. Thanks so much, Kyle. Uh, another. Google, there you go. Thanks, Jeff. I should have said save all applause to the end, but if it weren't, you got to do it. Um, another Google uh, Lunar X Prize alumni uh, with uh, Carson, Carson Becker, and PT Scientist. Why don't you tell us a little about what you're doing? Yeah, hi. Um, we PT Scientist are a Europe-based company that aims to um, bring things to the moon, but we are also thinking about infrastructure on the moon. So when you're on the moon, you um, you need to have an infra infrastructure in order to, to do things. And uh, in our first mission that um, is scheduled to launch at the earliest at the end of next year, we want to go back to Apollo 17 and want to take a look at the lunar rover vehicle that's been sitting on the moon for yeah almost 45 years and more now. And we want to create an Apollo moment that can inspire everyone on the world. And for that we have um, new partners in our uh, in our company that are helping us to transport this vision, and in particular, I'm talking about Red Bull that are helping us to reach everyone with our story um, on this whole planet. And um, yeah, we as a PT scientist, you know, what we what we have, what have been shown so far is mostly the governmental side of things. There is a the idea that new people or new companies should participate in the space race. Um, if you want, and 
we as PT scientists have shown that we understand big companies. We are, we are partnering with, uh, with Audi and with Vodafone and uh, we have uh, a few other ones that you find on our sleeves. <laughs> and we understand that this mission to the moon will not be driven by, by only the governmental agencies, but it will be driven by new companies and, um, and we are good at bringing those into the space sector and transporting their needs. And being based in Europe allows us to also work with, uh, with countries that are challenging, for example, if you're, um, if you're US based. So yeah, we want to include everyone uh, to, to come to our website, see that there is payload available and um, participate in it. And in regard to including everyone, um, there's a shameless plug. There's also a careers page. So if you're working in the space industry and you're looking for a new job, you can feel free to apply at us. Thanks. Great. Good to know you're hiring. <coughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and Asan, uh, I, I won't say we saved the best for last. We'll wait, wait, wait till after your remarks for that. But because of your patience, you, you get an extra minute. So okay. uh, uh, the floor is yours, Asan. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I saw a lot of cool pictures on TV and I got really, really excited. You know, a lot of new hardware, and uh, we are back on exploration business again. This is a great time in the United States. You are back in our exploration ag agenda. Our legacy aerospace companies, Boeing, Lockheed, is in full force, as well as emerging companies like Blue Origin and SpaceX. All are back on, uh, we're going somewhere. We're still kind of undecided. Sometimes we're going to Mars, sometimes we're going to Moon, but we're going somewhere. This is an amazing time. But if you look back, this is our second wave of exploration. In our first lunar landing, created a generation of engineers. This we call it a Sputnik generation. Look back, everything is there. Only thing is missing in our states is the excitement. The excitement of a future generation that want to be engineers or scientists and lead this exploration business. So, uh, so all those massively exciting things, there is a shadow somewhere. Um, so that shadow is that uh, our aerospace workforce is aging and most people are industry leaders now are basically the product of a Sputnik generation. We are not filling our pipeline that well. That's a huge problem, uh, I believe, is emerging. And the second thing is that if you look at our country's demographics is changing. Our aerospace workforce does not reflect our 21st century demographics. They're leaving, leaving a huge part of our population not engaged to the exploration business. And that raises a serious question about sustainability of our workforce. Uh, it, is a, it is a humongous issue if we want to stay in this, this uh, quest of uh, going back to Moon or, or going to Mars. Uh, we must be able to produce uh, talents. Uh, United States aerospace workforce has to be homegrown because of our export control and other regulations. And uh, we are not simply producing enough of those. Um, I've been told by Lockheed that just to maintain their uh, workforce, they need 5,000 engineers every month. It, just to maintain that existing level of workforce. This is an amazing channel, a challenge for us. Um, so back in 2010, uh, we partnered with Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. Basically, the F-35 program, they were increasingly ordered that they won't be able to ful fulfill the position. So the part, University of Texas, El Paso, is in a U.S.-Mexico border, served 26,000 students, but it's predom predominantly served the uh, Hispanic Americans, uh, who are the rapidly rising part of our population, but only 3% of our science and engineering workforce. We're the number one producer of Hispanic engineers. So Lockheed uh, Aeronautics and UTEP partnership was really a full-blown. Can we create an ecosystem within the university that produce this uh, workforce that are industry ready? So our engagement is really not most US universities are one or another are engaged with the aerospace industry. But some of the time, those, lim those engagements are basically limited to research and development. But what we have developed, become a national model, is a full-blown engagement. Curriculum innovation, new program development, exchanging personnel seamlessly, lot of internship programs, as well as in-house capacity building. I I'll be very happy to tell you with this eight years effort, we supplied the F-35 program nearly 250 engineers in the last eight years. In, a, in two weeks back, uh, in the same day hiring event, Lockheed made 31 offer in one afternoon. So you can see that engagement tied to close the gap of this huge uh, workforce issue. 
2010, also NASA got on board with us, specifically NASA Headquarter Office of Education, and start to set up the program. So our program is such a way designed that it actually engages this new generation in space and aerospace activities. It is not an isolated island that they just take courses. So some of my slides show some of the major programs we work with. Project Morpheus is a, NASA, it's a lunar lander program, as well as with Lockheed uh, Space System, uh, our orbital factory program, and obviously our legacy F-35 program. So what actually it showed that if we work together, industry and academia, and create an ecosystem that, uh, that allows this new generation of people uh, to come and get excited. You know, it's about, in the United States, it's about our population needs to get excited behind this huge exploration business. And to do that, obviously, you have to create that pipeline engagement uh, to create and sustain those workforce. So, uh, so our greatest story is that do we have a technology to do that? Of course, we have. But do we have a workforce to support that? I don't know about that. Well, I appreciate that, Asan, and I appreciate you, you mentioning the, the critical uh, importance of the workforce. As many know, the United States is a very generous country. Uh, let me tell you how generous we are. The top 50 uh, schools, universities in the U.S., 20% of the aerospace engineers are foreign, and we're so generous that we give them a diploma and we send them home <laughs> instead of keeping them. So. Uh, <laughs> Generous, maybe not too thoughtful. So uh, that's something we really, we really need to change, and we cha need to change how we look at ITAR and how uh, international partnerships are developed. Um, so thank you for that, Asan. Uh, I want to start getting, I don't want to call it quite a lightning round, because I, I want you to take your time and be thoughtful, but I want to kind of throw out a question to, to each of you, and then you know, kind of a group setting, and then, uh, and then we'll start taking some questions. How am I for time? I think we got about... 45 minutes, so uh, we'll try to get in as much as possible on this. But Tony, I, I want to kick it off to you. Um, what do you see are some of the most critical roles for the gateway uh, to support lunar and, and Mars exploration? What, what are some of the big ones that you're seeing right now? Yeah, so the, um, if we're, if we're going to do a sustained uh, lunar exploration, uh, talked about transportation there, talked about uh, access. So the first one is access to the gateway. Uh, so if uh, it, we, we've still got work to do on uh, resitu resource, resource utilization, we've got a lot of work to do. There's going to be a logistics, uh, significant logistics pull on a sustained lunar exploration campaign and having the ability, we've learned this from operating the International Space Station in low Earth orbit, Having dissimilar redundant uh, logistics uh, capability is, has saved the station over uh, her last 20 years. Um, so we'll need that. So the, the gateway provides, um, I don't want to say easy access, but, uh, but access. Uh, the other piece is access from uh, the gateway to the lunar surface. So uh, the... Uh, efficiency you get with solar electric propulsion uh, and the ability to, if you can keep the gateway uh, right sized and small, you can move it around. So any place on the lunar surface, I like the, I like the idea of taking pictures of the Apollo 17 uh, rover, but that's not the only place folks want to go on the moon. So having the, the gateway in place so that you can uh, access anywhere on the lunar surface I think is important. Uh, far side astronomy, uh, resources at the poles, uh, uh, ge significant geology near the South Pole. So it's, uh, I'll say, global access to the lunar surface. Uh, and then the other one from a sustainability standpoint, uh, and Oliver talked a little bit about this, is, uh, is driving affordability into the design. That allows you, and I think Peter mentioned it as well from the Apollo program, I'll have to go back and read some of what they were working on back then, because uh, I hadn't heard that, that they were looking at putting a gateway uh, in place during the Apollo program. So you can do reusable landers. Uh, we imagine initially uh, refuelable at the gateway. So think round trip on a single tank of gas from the gateway to the lunar surface and back. And then as we develop our uh, ISRU capabilities, now you can refuel those on the surface and go round trip up to the gateway and uh, back down to the surface. So. Uh, 
access to the gateway, the gateway's uh, ability to allow you to access anywhere on the lunar surface, and then it drives a reusability component into the rest of the architecture that we think is critical for affordability. Great, thank you so much. Um, Maria, yeah, we, we can find everyone to, to one slide, so I applaud everyone that made their slide very busy and a lot of things going yeah. on. <laughs> so, Maria, there was a lot going on in your slide. Tell us what you're involved with at, at Talas Alenia, you know, what, what's in your, your wheelhouse. Yeah, currently I would say that beside the technology to support uh, robotic exploration, uh, I think that uh, we are heavily uh, uh, developing new concepts for habitat that can offer the astronaut, uh, how can I say, a better environment. Uh, this uh, LOPG uh, infrastructure uh, will be a human-tended infrastructure, so we are still talking about uh, short permanence of people uh, in the vicinity of the moon, up between 30 and 40 days. But the idea here is to take this opportunity to test technology that will be used for uh, transit vehicle to Mars and for longer um, duration uh, permanence of humans uh, out of uh, our uh, ecosystem. And so we are working on providing uh, a better radiation protection uh, using, for example, uh, uh, flexible bags filled with water. Uh, we are designing um, internal layouts that can be reconfigured in orbit. Uh, we, we, we are talking about keywords, our flexibility, uh, our reconfiguration, our uh, immersive environment. These people will need uh, to feel at home somehow, or better, not to feel too far away from home. Uh, we are talking about uh, connectivity with uh, their family, uh, so back to Earth. Uh, we are talking about uh, really designing also, uh, how can I say, the uh, key subsystems in a different way. For example, uh, uh, IoT uh, to be provided uh, in, the, in the habitation module, uh, the possibility to control the, tem the temperature inside or in the vicinity where, where you're working. So uh, it's indeed a, a, a new way uh, to design the habitat. And we do that uh, both uh, through hardware, but uh, a lot also using uh, virtual reality. So we, we, we develop uh, the design, we test the design inside a computer, and then we prototype uh, the different components, and then we test them. Great, thank you. Hey, Jurgen, uh, tell us uh, some of the capabilities of the Ariane 6 for, for lunar missions. Yeah, I would uh, address four topics. First is performance, reliability, then precision guidance navigation, and uh, potentially also automatic dockings. A good background on that. Um, on performance, I think our advantage is that we have a three-stage rocket and ma main propulsion is cryogenic. So the highest performance uh, chemical propulsion with hydrogen and oxygen and uh, the three-stage design means that we have a small upper stage and this is leading to a very high performance compared to initial mass. So we, uh, we are at eight and a half tons in 2020 or 2021 and in 2025 with our evolution we are around 10 tons uh, lunar orbit. So I think it's quite a, an interesting solution for many of your applications. I, I'm very glad about all these various projects here. Then uh, reliability is uh, okay. Is our brand since uh, many, many years and now since more than 15 years we have been really perfect in all missions. I think this is key for this type of, let's say, also high investment missions so we cannot uh, take any risks. Uh, we are also, in all our missions today, in the last 10 years, if you look, uh, if it's a, ge a geostationary, uh, a GTO missions, uh, uh, MEO, LEO, whatever, we have a very precise navigation and guidance algorithms, so we can really uh, maximize the benefit of, uh, of, of the energy we have on board. And uh, at the end, okay, with the ATV, we have, a, let's say, also a good background, a shared background with, the, with the Airbus uh, of automatic docking, so coming to the gateway and to docking with any kind of vehicle, this can be a good contribution as well. Great. Asana, I have a 
Keep going. Uh, Asan, I have a, a quick question for you. Um, some of the, the, the key features and benefits of all the partnerships that you have, um, that you've developed with NASA and Lockheed and other partners, can you talk about that a little bit? Um, obviously, the key partnership is that you can train your you know, students in a setting that is more acceptable to, to the industry. So our, our goal is to create industry-ready professionals. To achieve that goal, only academics cannot train uh, the students. So that partnership really created an ecosystem for us that allows students not only to get very excited working with the real-world professionals who build space systems for living, uh, to the knowledge exists in the industry and slowly translate back to the academia. Academia seems to be sometimes a bit isolated from, from the real world. So that partnership, that's the number one, that created the excitement and the, uh, the process of training students. Uh, obviously, second, second aspects of it, it built capacity. It built a humongous capacity within the university uh, to really uh, uh, produce engineers who, are, who has a higher design skills and a skill set that is more uh, valuable to the industry. Um, I believe those are the two major things that happen, the internal capacity building as well as the skill set development that accelerated the, their assimilation to the industry. Yeah, Maria, you if want if to I may comment, yeah, Azan, because uh, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, years ago, uh, in Thales Alenia Space, we realized that that was going to be a problem. So we started to um, support a, pro a program involving and preparing the young engineer specifically for system engineering aspect related to space exploration. So uh, for the last 10, 15 years, I don't know precisely, uh, we run this uh, program in Europe, is uh, Torino plus UK uh, plus France. Uh, and every year uh, we prepare between uh, 15 and 20 new system engineers. So after they get their degree in engineering, they join uh, this program for one year. They start to work uh, with us and so then they become our colleagues. And I believe that is working beautifully. I will be involved in another GNF uh, in two days and we will speak precisely about uh, workforce development, and so you are more welcome to join. Great. Thanks, Mary. Hey, Peter, how do we make going back to the moon more sustainable and, and not a repeat of what Apollo was? You know, part, part of that, I think, is looking at putting the infrastructure, I think the, the word was used further or down the line here at one of the comments, but putting the right infrastructure in place. You know, one analogy I always use is the government's build the highways and then cities tend to pop up along the way based on uh, demand where you have to stop to use the restroom or get food. You know, so if you think of it from that kind of a perspective, you know, the gateway is a great piece of infrastructure that's been talked about where it creates that stopping point outside the Earth's gravity well where you can actually use it as a staging point for a lot of things. Whether it's to go to the surface of the moon, which has been talked about repeatedly here, but it's also, you know, you think about what you can do at the gateway, it's a great opportunity as a proving ground for everything we want to go to, uh, as we go into deeper into space. You know, one of the comments I talk about a lot is, you know, when we looked at environmental control systems and we did the demonstration of that on the ground for space station, it worked great on the ground and we got it up to space station. We didn't realize lubricants and gears and mechanisms don't work the same in microgravity. And so we're about, yeah, who knew? <laughs> and so now, you know, it's, we're probably about a 70% reliability factor on our environmental control systems, but we have to get a lot better. And we have to understand how that operates in, a, in an environment like deep space where you're outside the Van Allen belts and you have radiation effects. Same with electronic boxes, uh, same with human beings. Um, it's also a great proving ground for, you know, some of the systems we're gonna take to Mars eventually where we can actually do sorties that are long duration missions and experience that. So, you know, to me, the way you make it sustainable is you build the right pieces of the infrastructure that really aren't just a one-point solution, but something that's sustainable and allows us to continue to improve and demonstrate systems that allows us to explore onto Mars and beyond. Great. Uh, Nicholas, did I go dead? Um, talk to us a little about the current activities. We were talking about the workforce and everything. Some of the, the current activities that are that OHB has going on to attract that young talent to, and to educate that next generation of workforce. What do you, it, it, the picture showed a lot of young, young folks there and you know, what's the secret sauce that you guys have figured out? 
Yeah, well, um, first of all, so what we're trying to do is really to bring up this, let's say, new way of designing maybe, and maybe one of the keywords that are also interesting to mention at this point, I mean, if we're talking about the moon village, the gateway or whatever, it's really at some point this idea of an open architecture, this idea that you are trying from the design, from the inception, from the very beginning of the design to think along these lines, which is maybe something that was not yet a given some, let's say, 50 years ago, when at that time you um, educated space engineers. So this is really something where we are trying or what we're trying to take into account. And yes, yeah, so right now what we are doing is really to see also in terms of payloads and landers what is on the market right now, what is needed, and to find a little bit a niche. And those young students are really doing well when it comes to such analysis, you know, because they're bringing in new ideas. Oliver, we, you and I were at the, uh, the lunar announcement last uh, yesterday afternoon, the sun beaming in our face, the ironicness of that. Um, and you, you had a, a grin from, from ear to ear about how excited you were about it. Tell us about your excitement on the, the moon race and, and the involvement that, that Airbus has. Yeah, the moon race is uh, fascinating for two aspects. First of all, it was invented by young employees in the company. So we have uh, set up a program about two years ago, which we call Shake and Shape, where we give opportunities to those which tended to be unheard in big corporate organizations over the last decades. And they came up with these brilliant ideas which, which go very much along also what we said here. There are so many synergies out there if everybody would work together more effectively, then we could make progress more quick. So this is what it's all about. At the beginning I was skeptic, I must say, because I thought it sounds a bit like a reload of the Google Lunar X Prize or something like that. And I think it's, it's, it's different. I think it's um, sort of connecting the ideas of the Lunar Village and, uh, you know, going there quickly, in a one shot maybe, and, and now it's basically opening up several areas where just a couple of young guys are saying, on top of my normal job, I'm available to try and coordinate that. And everybody's welcome. So we've been talking to companies in the US, we've been talking to governments, including China, and trying to understand who's, who's ready to offer a free ride to somebody who wants to go there and has a great idea. So now it's really an idea competition contest where it's not so much um, you know, being focused and get a couple of million or so. It's also not so much on being the, 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 the quickest or the best. It is more on, on um, leveraging capabilities that are not really benefited from right now. Awesome. Hey, Kyle, um, I got to ask you. You've raised over or close to $100 million so far. One, how did you do it? And two, what are you going to do, do with all that money? <laughs> well, it was, it was pretty tough. I heard this statistic earlier today uh, that 97.7% of hardware companies fail. That's incredible. And I, I sit up here on the stage with you know, these men who represent these amazing companies like Lockheed and Boeing and, you know, they've went through this tremendous growth and somehow survived. And, and I often think, you know, how are we able to convince them to give us this money? It was tough, honestly. And what we, we decided to do is first, we had to show that there was a value proposition that existed. And second, we couldn't just go to venture capital. So we actually got the money from two different sources. One was from venture capital. These were development banks in Japan. All the money is Japanese, by the way. Half of it was Development Bank Japan and another uh, big, large venture capital called Inc.J. And then the other half was corporates. So corporate companies that included the automotive industry, the architecture industry, telecommunications industry. So all, we got all these different industries and we showed them that actually this investment in our company is going to give you the opportunity to have insight into what we're going to be doing in the future. Because when we talk about involving everyone, we have to understand that if we're going to build something on the moon, we really need to look much further beyond the space industry. We're just this tiny, tiny sector amongst all these other giants which really need to help us uh, to succeed. And so we showed them that the opportunity exists on the moon because what's happened right now, I don't know if you realize it, is that 
the moon is seriously coming back in big fashion. Somewhere, sometime, I don't know, recently, someone started talking about it, and now everyone's talking about the moon. All of the Asian countries are gearing up to go to the moon. America, with some really strong leadership from the top, has just put 2.3 billion down. Europe, I really hope Europe is gonna make a strong commitment because they need to. And what the investors saw is that, okay, there's going to be some business that's coming up with this. So we were able to show them that we have this value proposition. And one of the questions that I saw here was how are we gonna pay back the money? That's a big question. Uh, and it's, it's complicated, right? I mean, you think about it, we, we raised 100 million. I have to give one third of that money to a launcher company right away. I have to use venture capital and pay for a launcher. Now that's pretty, that's pretty tough. But what we're going to do is we have basically three main things. First, we do advertising, sponsorship. We're going to give companies this unique opportunity to put their brand on the lunar surface and show how, how cool they are because everyone thinks space is cool. The second is that we're gonna deliver payloads, as I mentioned before. So we're a small company that delivers small payloads to the moon. And the third thing is every mission that we do, we're going to send our own rover and we're gonna be collecting data, topography, environment, resource data, and then we're gonna sell that data back to larger customers in the long run. So that's, that's the plan right now. You need help with that launch uh, issue. We can talk to Jurgen. I got some friends in the audience have launch vehicles, so we'll, we'll take care of you. Knock off two percent or something. So, uh, we're, we're team players here. So, um, Carson, I haven't forgot about you. Uh, like an Irish father trying to keep all my children in line here. So the the ninth, but not the last. Um, you guys are, are pursuing. I, I spent some time at your your booth yesterday, and it's fantastic. You guys are pursuing uh, w with your rover a lot of uh, corporate sponsorship as well. I think. Uh, as you mentioned, you had Audi and um, Vodafone and some others. Talk to them, how, how did you broker those deals? And, and are they, as Kyle was talking about, are they plentiful? Are there, are there outside non-space companies that want to get involved? Are you seeing that? So um, the way it worked was that um, Audi approached us because um, they had the idea that they want to put a vehicle in the most you know, daring environment that they could think of, and that is the moon. And uh, with like, I, I think I can honestly say that they have zero knowledge about uh, space. So um, they approached us and said, us, "Hey, you want? Uh, can you help us to, to bring those rovers to the moon?" And we were like, "Yes, we can do that." But um, of course, they they need a lot of of guidance from our side. And I think um, this is one of the the key factors in involving everyone is um, to not just be transparent in the pricing that you can know what you're what you're getting into, but um, also helping. To, to get the instruments on board in order to get it to the moon. We want to, um, the goal of space exploration should not be to be afraid of stepping into the rocket, and, uh, but it should be the excitement about arriving at the destination. And this is what, what we care about. We care about um, uh, from the customer approaching us um, with an idea until they get, um, they get anything to the moon. And we are supporting them with engineering services on the, all the way up to the moon. Okay. All right, great. So I haven't looked at the questions yet from the audience, but I will get to that. I did see that we were getting, we got trolled by Elon. Um, that <laughs> how, about, uh, how about all of you guys jump on the BFR and join the artist in 2023? I guess that would have to be a, a pro bono flight uh, if, they're, if they're paying for it. I guess some of us would be willing to do it. Um, but uh, to that end, I just want to maybe a question for the group, but how does reusability play in the, the lunar activities and lunar architecture? What, what do you guys see on that? And this is kind of open to everyone. I'll start if you want. Uh, you know, I, I think I showed a picture that we talked about um, using at least part of the lander as reusable, at least the ascent piece we thought makes a lot of sense because you can cycle that back and forth to the gateway and refuel it at the gateway, or as, as Tony said, as fuel comes online, maybe you, you change that architecture a little bit. Um, but yeah, you could argue also the gateway in itself, like space station, is really a reusable asset. Station's been around, human tended now for 18 years. And so the gateway is gonna be existing for a long time out in space where it's human tended for a portion of time and really a science lab for the rest of it. Um, I, I see there's a lot of opportunity for reusability on that part of the architecture. You know, I, I step back a little bit on launch reusability. Um, yeah, I say economics really should drive what you do on launch. 
Uh, and I use, uh, you know, the space shuttle is a good example. We reuse the shuttle a lot. It costs a lot of money to build a shuttle. It didn't make sense to throw one away every time, so we reuse the shuttle. We did look at reusing the solid rocket boosters. Uh, you know, they would land by parachute in the ocean. We'd pick them up and bring them back. And after a while, NASA studied it, and it cost $40 million more every year to actually reuse them than it was to build new ones. Partly because of the infrastructure, you need to capture them, recover them, and when they hit salt water, it's not a good thing. So, you know, there, you really need the economics to drive your decision when you look at reusability, at least from a launch perspective. And I'd say in deep space, too. Maybe, yeah. If I can uh, co complement, it's economics and physics as well. Yes. So, uh, because there was also the question about the reusable boosters. Yes. So we are working on this topic. We will have a, an engine, a reusable engine called Prometheus, which is very, let's say, competitive in the future. But at the end, to move to these boosters, it must be an economic, economic benefit. But going to the moon means that you really have a, a very high delta V mission, as we say. So you need lots of energy. And reusability means that you have to carry things you don't need absolutely for this kind of mission, so you have to balance the interest of that. If it's not more interesting to have the maximum performance and not be reusable because at the end, okay, you have to pay a price for that, a technical price, a physical price, not only uh, an economic one. So to be studied further, but I'm not convinced for the rocket part, maybe for the boosters one day, but it's to be seen in the global business, business model. Anyone else on the reusable? I'll go real quick. So yeah, from the physics standpoint, it uh, it depends. Definitely, the the farther out you want to go, or the faster you want to go, the higher the penalty is, right? So it's like three percent to recover a first stage. Uh, from an economic standpoint, it's not about reusability; it's about affordability. And mm -hmm. so we got to think of it more as capturing first stages. We've we've seen all seen the videos of capturing first stages. I can't believe you still have to pay a third of your venture capital money just for a ride when getting all the way to the moon and on the surface and all the stuff, the rest of the stuff you're talking about doing is is so awesome and there's challenges along the way, but um, I really look forward to seeing you all be successful. It, the idea that we're catching first stages and that they're still that expensive uh, is is keeping more uh, folks from, uh, from joining in. You talked about how hard it was to raise money. Um, so you need to start thinking about reusability in a in kind of I'll say a broader context, right? And it's um, reusing designs, reusing development efforts, reusing test equipment, uh, reusing test equipment scripts, right? So to drive affordability into the whole architecture. And so we see the reusing the hardware, but if we're actually going to make the moon accessible to everyone. Uh, we've got to drive affordability into all parts of the design, and so it's not just uh, reusing the hardware; it's reusing, uh, reusing the, the whole thing. I absolutely, and just to add, if you allow, and to the, uh, in situ research utilization that was mentioned by, by by some of you folks, I think it's also to find an effective way to replenish the consumables, right? Be the consumables for for human beings, in terms of, of gases and, and water. But also in terms of propellants, I, I find that quite appealing to, to try and understand how we can use the resources of the lunar surface to, uh, let's say, get our consumables out of there. That, that avoids that we have to transport all these kilos from Earth to Moon. So I, I, I think we must talk about the overall reusability concept, as Tony suggests, and try to do as much as possible in space, in situ, whatever that is. And that includes not always repeat the development that you've done before. Uh, okay. If I may uh, comment, uh, I think that uh, key words for sustainability are reusability, are in situ resource utilization. Uh, for me, is also really open architectures, so evolving through architecture development. And to be able to do that, not only in a philosophical uh, and fashion type of uh, way, uh, we need to talk about uh, uh, commonalities, we need to talk about interfaces, uh, we need to talk about common protocols. So to be realistic, uh, we really need to establish the possibility that two different uh, contributions coming from two different countries can work together. Maybe they need to dock, maybe they need to be interchangeable. And for me, this is a critical item, really. Common interfaces, uh, 
common protocols uh, to move from uh, theoretical statement to possible uh, facts. Great, thanks. I'm going to paraphrase one of the questions that we have. Um, it's dealing with, uh, as, as we all can see, there's no national space agencies on the stage here. It's all you know, commercial and private companies. Um, but the question is, how do uh, each of your companies, how are they willing to take the risk that space agencies are not taking to speed up the timeline on getting to the lunar surface? Um, and then I'll, I'll phase in a cost that, uh, how, are, how are you doing it at a, an affordable cost where maybe the agencies don't realize that same cost? So um, feel free, take it. Well, Carson. we just do it. You just do it, all right. Yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> you know, the, um, are you trying to get Nike too? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hmm. um, we have another um, on-shoe uh, okay. sponsor. Um, anyhow, the, uh, the thing is that um, we, if we wait for the government to, to do all the things and uh, make the money to, to get funding, um, the pace is definitely too slow. Um, so at the moment, uh, our mission is, uh, has, contains 0% of governmental funding. And um, I think this will not change for the first mission, but we are, this doesn't mean that we are not working um, with the space agencies. I think the role of the space agencies will change in the future towards a curator of the science, and, uh, and they will just order the delivery um, as they order um, yeah, a bus ticket, for example. And I think this is, um, the, so the roles need to change. And uh, I think the, um, the private industries like ours are driving um, new ideas into the market and new customers into the market, um, which can help to accelerate the timeline significantly. Great. And we're taking more risk. Um, this is... Uh, Got to lean forward. <laughs> no, maybe... Okay, uh, now in 6, the, the, the change compared to the past is that we are design authority. So we take the responsibility and the risks with respect to the design. And this makes things much quicker and also more efficient. Now we do it in half the time and for half the cost, the development of RN6 compared to the past. On the other hand, let's say for this type of big endeavors, I think the agencies will keep a certain role because we speak mainly about science, about infrastructures, let's say enabling business afterwards. But I think without the agencies, and you see also the budgets which are spent in the US for that, you will not go very fast. So industry can take the technological risks, the design risks, for sure. So we are quicker and uh, have less reviews and all this. But OK, I think this, uh, the, the sharing with the agencies will have a, a certain balance in the future as well. So I think uh, maybe to add a different perspective on that, it's not only linked into the question agencies as a customer. I think if you have a customer, then you need to create a value for somebody who's giving you money for that, right? There's only very limited people who can afford to do that with their own money. So they probably don't have that question. They only have to justify in front of themselves. Um, I think governments uh, do have a certain role, in particular if we think about in building up infrastructure to allow business, to enable business. And here we need to respect that the customer is having his processes, his culture, his way of working. And I, I think we should not completely ignore that and say that that's wrong and then we go for full commercial and that's, that's better and quicker. Um, I think we must find the, the right balance in it, as Jürgen was explaining that. So we think more in terms of uh, public-private partnerships where um, maybe we don't talk about converting exploration into a commercial market today, but where industry takes more responsibility where we know that we can be more focused and more efficient in terms of industrial processes, right? But let's not forget that this is also coming from a heritage. If today we design for NASA or for ESA or for agencies, it always comes with the heritage of what they experience, and it, it typically comes with a fatal accident. So if you design for crew, I think you need to factor in that things happened in the past that we want to avoid. So, you know, if I see the commercial folks going to the moon with a one shot, 70% probability you reach the lunar surface in good shape. That is something that we cannot afford if human beings are on board. So I think we need to differentiate, but certainly redefining the way how we work with the agencies, that is something that is in our interest. So, Peter, I think. Well, I was going to add on to that a little bit about different contracting models and risk po mo postures because, you know, we're building the CST100 Starliner which you talk about a different risk posture on an industry. It's a fixed price service contract to the government. We're taking all the risk on the development side. 
And so, so yes, industry is taking risk on to accelerate things. And if you look at what's going on with the gateway, it's another great example. You know, uh, the first element that NASA's in procurement for right now is the power propulsion element. And the whole philosophy is to leverage the commercial satellite industry. So it's all the investment that all of us in the satellite industry, and I can look at at least a couple on the stage that are doing this, you know, we've put a lot of investment in commercial satellites. And so it's our investment that's out helping to accelerate putting a capability up there for NASA and, and the U.S. government, as well as the international partnership to start the gateway. And, and I could say we're doing the same thing with Next Step because industry is putting money in to accelerate technologies and capabilities to, to try to bring Gateway on sooner. So I think we are doing it as an industry. Son, did you? Yeah, um, I, I don't believe those risk environment is unique to either industry or NASA because I think it's a collective environment that how much risk we can tolerate. Uh, so. Uh, it, it's originated from most of the exploration business still funded by government, frankly speaking, directly or indirectly funded by taxpayer money. As a nation, we have a threshold of how much risk we can take, and a loss of a human is unacceptable to the United States' point of view. So I think all the risk originated from this thematic focus that we have to get it right. Uh, it, it's not getting there faster, but actually getting there. So I believe the risk environment is this product of our threshold that we want to get it right, uh, not get it very quick and messed it up because some spectacular failure in this business will probably forever delay the exploration business. So doing it right, I think, should be the, the first and foremost uh, uh, position. I got a, I got a question. Um, from my background at, at uh, the Commercial Space Life Federation, we have a lot of companies that were funded um, by the individual, um, Blue Origin, uh, SpaceX, Sierra Nevada, uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, but there's several, there's a handful of private or uh, public companies here on the stage that now have venture arms. Boeing does, Airbus does, Lockheed does, I assume Ariane does. Do you see with your venture arms, um, how are you looking at some of these young, new startup companies and where do you see the money to invest? And I know you guys aren't managing those portfolios, but from a larger perspective, are, are your companies investing in, in some of these uh, smaller startups? And, uh, and if there's folks, startups in the room, you know, who should they talk to? Tony, you're, you're nodding, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it to you first. Yeah, um, our president and CEO, Marilyn Houston, made a, a public announcement, I think about six months ago, about our, her uh, increased emphasis on our uh, investment arm. Um, uh, yeah, if you're a, a startup and working on something great, please come by the uh, Lockheed Martin booth and, uh, and we'll trade business cards after this because we're definitely interested. Uh, the question was broken up between space agencies and industry, but it, it really is a spectrum, right? So there's, there's certain things the government is going to do. I think Oliver's example was infrastructure and, um, and some of that. There's uh, stuff that the large companies are going to be optimized before, just like uh, Peter, we've made a large investment in uh, our commercial satellite capability and we're looking for all kinds of ways to leverage that, including uh, selling that back to the government in, a, in the form of a power and propulsion element for the space agency. Um, but there's, there's definitely things that the small companies are doing. So it's, it's not whether or not you're taking on risk, it's, it's what type of risk, what scale, what time frame, and that kind of stuff. So I, I see it as way more of a spectrum uh, that there's opportunities across that whole spectrum than I do uh, its government or its uh, industry. Jurgen? No, we uh, have been already since, since a number of years been working with, uh, let's say, external innovation as well, meaning startups, uh, small companies, uh, research centers, to speed our R&T efforts. So we, we spend our money in uh, also with partnering with such companies, but it's more in a what we call a deep tech vision, meaning we, we work with uh, startups which are very specific and, and maybe uh, interesting in certain technological solutions. I don't believe that they can bring a, a, the type of system competence we have and the risk management for such big programs, but they can really benefit uh, in, in certain very special technologies like 3D printing or surface treatments or, or whatever, uh, electronic systems. So this is the way we work with them. And then taking a participation or not is a, is a more strategic point of view, but it's really the collaboration is there and it's important, yes. 
Oliver, how about, how about you guys? Well, we're where, where's by, where's by, the Silicon Valley over here for you guys? We're, we're driven by uh, innovation and, and creativity since, since our start as, as ever as a group, right? Now then, if you're successful, you turn into a large corporation and you see the downside of that. So we're, we're, um, we're acting against that or in, in full uh, acceptance of that fact. We're really collaborating a lot with smaller companies or let's say with all companies of all sides. Uh, which are having an interest in the same things that we are having an interest in. So I, I can only uh, cite that I'm already having customers that are startups, and I give them a hard time by not signing contracts for six months because the process is so hard. So um, really one takeaway is that we need to get acquainted to that, but we really do that from different perspectives. We see ourselves as investors. We see ourselves as um, the system guys, as, as Jürgen was mentioning, supporting and helping. We're also uh, adopting to that and accepting that some of you will be our customers. And I think that's all fine. I think we need to get acquainted to that. And we also need to factor in, as we were discussing about education, that there are many out there who rather prefer to be a founder than a new employee of a corporate organization. So I think we also need to think about new models of how to collaborate to make the progress that we want to do. So from that perspective, we have various initiatives around there. Uh, some around a cube that you may have heard of in the, in the United States where we are rather Supporting programs there is venture capital out there as well There is also still the good old opportunity to work on a normal commercial business uh, uh, Relationship or to hire so that's everything is possible. I think we need to factor in many many more tools than we did in the past Yeah, we also follow the same model uh, for the last uh, 10 years uh, we have been working as I mentioned before with uh, small and medium enterprises uh, to develop uh, specific technologies in partnership. And that proved to be a winning type of uh, scheme. Uh, and by the way, the effort was uh, uh, co-financed by the local region and uh, fully supported by our R&D uh, resources. And uh, the name was STEPS system and technology for space exploration. So precisely focus on uh, what needed for moon and Mars exploration. How about right. yourself? Uh, so we have a group uh, called Horizon X. Um, we've had them in existence for over a year now. And actually we have two individuals here at the show, so they're in our booth. And so they're really looking at um, companies that have capabilities or technologies that they're developing that align from a strategic point of view of where we want to go. Uh, they look at, I'd say, minority investments, not, you know, this is an M&A discussion at this point, it's minority investments. So it's really seeing where we can leverage your technology into what we're doing or maybe bring some Boeing expertise to help your technology out. So it's both ways. And uh, like I said, if you're interested, drop by the booth and you can have a conversation with uh, either one of them. Okay. We're closing in on our time, but I saw an interesting question come up and I want to <laughs> paraphrase it a little bit because... Uh, I don't like the total question, but with the rapid development of artificial intelligence, um, well, what do you feel the role, I'm gonna stop there, what do you guys feel the role of um, artificial intelligence is? Because then they go on to say, do you think that uh, human spaceflight will be replaced sooner or later or completely? And I don't, I don't wanna talk about replacing human uh, spaceflight before we get back there. So let's put, uh, put that on the back burner, but the, the role of artificial intelligence they talked a little bit on the previous panel, but what, how do you guys see that evolving and developing? You want to go? Good as a support, <laughs> but a thing that people want to explore. So I cannot imagine a machine to replace a human being with the willing to step on Mars, honestly. So to support, yes, important, but to enjoy the exploration, I want to... I believe that humankind deserve it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that you can exclude artificial intelligence moving forward. It's going to be part of our life. We have to accept it. But I also view this as an augmentation rather than a replacement. Yes. So it will be around us, it will be wrapping us, and we, we have to live with it. And hopefully uh, it will not lead to a killer robot. As long as it doesn't go there, we're all okay. But it will make exploration uh, cheaper, frankly speaking. We will have a lot of autonomous systems that allow us to explore without putting humans in unnecessary risk. If I may, that's, that's exactly how we are planning to use it. So just last summer, there was a program at NASA called FDL, 
and that was with a lot of the largest corporations that are working on artificial intelligence. And basically, we should use AI to help us to sift through all of this data. Because every mission that we're going to be doing, we're going to get terabytes and terabytes of data. And we can't, as humans, with our limited intelligence, just sift through all that. But what the artificial intelligence can do is you know, point us the right direction and for us, what we're going to use that for is for autonomous rovers. So we intend to build that into our systems to help us to deliver a networked, basically 10 to 15 rovers that are networked and able to work together to explore different regions on the moon. So I think that is the first great application for exploration and will really help us to, to decrease costs, as was mentioned. Yeah. Speaking about m massive data, you also generate massive data when you produce complex products. So we are really, uh, also thanks to a strong French investment plan in artificial intelligence, working on implementing these solutions in our manufacturing system because you, all the data your machine are, machines are generating, you can then use to uh, ensure the quality of the product from the beginning and typically 3D printing, for example, where it's very difficult to do the uh, the, 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 the quality control after the production, you have to do it during the process. And here, these type of solutions are really helping. So it's for us also a, a solution for the industrial way of producing quickly, reliable, quality and cheap our products. This isn't uh, necessarily the, the f this is the present for us, not just the future, right? So we're taking uh, existing uh, data off of our communication satellites. We're looking at uh, International Space Station data today and running it through various algorithms to try to help predict. So the way we operate uh, human spaceflight today, I contend there's to some degree, uh, if you'll allow me to stretch the bounds of artificial, right? So the space station, amazing machine. It's got six folks up there, really talented and capable. But all the intelligence comes from the control centers that are still on Earth uh, all around the world. Uh, and that's the intelligence that actually operates the space station today. Uh, from a logistics standpoint, right, we, have, we talked about dissimilar redundant uh, access uh, from a logistics standpoint. As you get out to the moon, you have the comm delays that would still permit that existing operation model. The logistics get a lot harder. So if you can look at your gateway uh, data to start predicting what your logistics needs will be in the future, you can, you can start lead turning that. But um, as soon as you push out from the moon and go anywhere farther away, the communications delay won't permit the, all the intelligence of the world's control centers to keep the human explorers safe. And so you've got to figure out how to take uh, the terabytes of data that the uh, I'll say the Mars Transit Vehicle produces, analyze that in, uh, in real time, and then, f and then figure out how uh, the crew and the machine can work together to keep them uh, healthy and safe. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can I interrupt? Because I'm sorry, I just got to take the moderator's perspective. Okay. So um, we only have about a minute and a half or so. So I, I want to leave with a final question. Clay, uh, hit us up on what's your favorite movie. I'm going to try doing some more paraphrasing. Um, before our current president said that we're going to the moon in the Space Policy Directive 1 about a year and a half ago, uh, another president said, we choose to go to the moon. And not I want you to finish that sentence. It. Not because So start going around, well, you choose to go to the moon, and then when? <laughs> Peter. I, I choose to go to the moon to really set the foundation for how we can go beyond the moon. And I'd say we get to the moon in... 25 to 28. Okay. We Nicholas. choose to go to the moon because it's an inherent drive of the human being to explore. And we will do so. Do I need to be factual or is it a hope? Do I need to? Oh, that's why I gave a range. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 2030. 2030, okay. Uh, as, a ma as a humanity, you mean, or getting to the moon? It can be either way. Either way. Either <laughs> way. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, I think we chose to go to the moon because it's a stepping stone further into space. We need to have the technology tested and ready on a celestial body that's uh, conveniently close by um, to get back in the case of an emergency. And uh, we should do so by earliest by next year or maybe 
uh, two years with yeah, robotics. Brand new vehicle. <laughs> All right, Maria. Yeah, I I fully agree. We need to go to the moon because it's the logical next step. The moon is so close. We enjoy to grasp it every time there is a full moon. I feel attracted. So really, for me, there is no better place for the next. Uh, go for humankind in space, so simply like that. And for when? As soon as, pos as, soon as possible, because I'm getting old. <laughs> I've been discussing about uh, exploration roadmaps for the last 30 years, and I really want to see people walking on the moon before it's too late. So 10 years from now, people right. there. That's yeah. Oliver? Well, I think we all share the same vision. Uh, if not, we wouldn't have been invited here by you, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, for me personally, if I'm accepting Elon's invite, I would say 2023, <laughs> if he keeps his schedule with the BFR and the artist. <laughs> but I guess we have a flight to the moon with Orion in 2020, right? So yeah. that's about the time frame, and then going down to the surface as quick as possible, maybe 2024, if we want it. Awesome. Uh, moon should be our transit, right? So and I, I believe that we will be there before 2025, but we must colonize Mars. And why? Uh. Because uh, it's, a, it's a frontier, right? We've already been in Moon. <clears throat> our next frontier is Mars. Tony? Yeah, so for me, I, I consider myself an explorer, so uh, I, I think we, uh, we need to explore uh, the why, and I'll, my why, I think, applies to both, right? It's to bring that knowledge back to benefit all of humanity. And, uh, and I'm ready for the win, I'm ready now, so. Awesome, awesome, Kyle. So I would say we choose to go to the moon in 2020 to expand our social and economic sphere to benefit Earth. It's always gotta come back and benefit Earth. And, and I have to say, and I think many of you in the industry face this, People often ask, why are you spending money on going to the moon? I get that question so many times. And what we're developing right now is like an army of answers of how going to the moon is going to directly benefit Earth. Awesome. Jürgen, we'll end uh, it with you. I can just join in. It's the next natural frontier, but it's also a very good place for exploration, but for science as well, astronomy. So this is, I think, a very good reason to expand to the moon and as soon as possible, meaning okay, 2020, first mission, but I would say a major endeavor worldwide, maybe in 2025, would be already a great challenge and a great achievement. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to all the panelists. I, uh, please give them a, a warm <coughs> round of applause. I know, I know there was a lot of questions that came in uh, on the Slido, and we weren't able to get to all of them, but please engage the panelists. These are some of the brightest minds that we have and looking at this lunar exploration, how we get them all, how we get everyone involved. So uh, as I said, please engage them. And thank you so much for the time and joining us today. All right, great, thanks. Thank you.